I'm here with the man with the most last names in wrestling history. We're going to call him John Hennigan. We're going to go with his real name here. Ooh, uh, for it's, getting real. it's getting real. For the love of wrestling with Monopoly events. And you're here with Tyre, your wife. We're here to discuss Johnny Loves Tyre on AEW's YouTube channel. And how everything. He, everything. So everything. Johnny Loves Tyre. So Johnny Loves Tyre is a weekly web show. It's fully scripted. It drops every Wednesday at 6 a.m. Pacific time. I don't know what time that is here, but um, Taya, I, a friend of ours, Justin, there's just a small team um, do everything. So it's something that we're really proud of. It takes a lot of time for us to do. It's free on AEW's YouTube page. Um, Well, I'm biased, but I think it's great, and I think you guys should check it out. How do you and Taya even switch off away from wrestling because you are two of the best wrestlers on the planet. Do you have go-to things where you're like, we can't discuss wrestling right now. we got to do our hobbies. we got to just be normal for a minute. She definitely does. I don't have any normal hobbies. <laughs> my, my hobbies are going to parkour gyms. Um, I, I take stunt fighting classes, uh, stunt sword, barbarian sword. I just finished stunt coordinating a movie. It was a horror movie called Dead at Night. That was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I've got a wooden dummy in the house that Ty was not happy about when it showed up. A dummy? Well, a wooden dummy is basically for Wing Chun. It is 117 original movements that Ip Man came up with. At one point, I got all the way up to 117, but I kind of forgot. And now it's just like a clothes hanger. It doesn't match the, the rest of the room's color, which is what she was upset about. Um... Ty's hobbies are like going out to see your friends and having dinner, and, and I do that too. But, um, but, but usually I'm just doing weird stuff, <laughs> making up concepts like Barricane or The Grenader or uh, William Wallace Sasquatch Uprising, short films like that, you know. And thinking about your next potential boxing match as well. That's what uh, yeah. we were talking about as well. You kind of want a bit of KSI, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I... First of all, I saw a clip of him watching me call him out after I knocked out Harley in Creator Clash 2. And he watched me box for a few seconds and laughs and goes, Shh, John Morris, you know, I knocked him out, guy. <laughs> what? He, first of all, was like 180. I don't even know if I could fight him. I'd have to cut weight or he'd have to come up. But there's no way that dude could touch me. Like, I'm bigger than him, stronger than him, quicker than him. He, he could box for 10 years and not touch me. He's... He's a YouTube celebrity guy. I'm a pro athlete. I'm a professional wrestler. I could knock him over just by pushing him. What do you make of his fight with Tommy Fury? It was a very controversial decision. A lot of people thought that he beat Tommy Fury. And I know Tommy was kind of in your sights as well, potentially to train with, maybe not necessarily fight, but you probably would want to fight him as well, wouldn't you? No, I like Tommy. I like Tommy a lot. I think Tommy is real humble and real genuine. I think KSI is just got that kind of like abrasive energy like he has to win of course KSI thinks he won he probably thinks he deserves everything no Tommy won that fight um it was a close fight they were both throwing punches if you keep score like the judges did Tommy Fury won it's as simple as that get over it KSI so you'd need probably need like a couple of more tune-up fights two more fights before you start looking at someone like a KSI or a Logan Paul, as you've mentioned. Logan Paul would be fun to beat up too, yeah. Who, who would those guys be to get to that next level, to get to those KSI, Logan Paul main events? Well, I asked, I've called up the Liver King twice. Uh, no response. One was he uh, let go of some of his staff, and I knew one of them. I asked him personally. He said no. Um, and recently I reached out to Bradley Martin, who's who would be tough. He's a... Uh, He's a fitness guy. He's in L.A. Uh, he's a beast of a human, 270, does CrossFit, six-pack, like 8% body fat, 6'6". <laughs> six, six. I don't know what Thank I was God. thinking. <laughs> but um, it, to, to sell a fight, like, I have to find somebody that isn't an easy fight. Like, I, I can't just, like, uh, fight Salt Poppy's cousin who has no training. Salt Poppy, I don't know. That guy's tough. He's legit. I don't even know if I'd, if I'd, if I'd want to fight Salt Poppy. But um, that's the whole point of what, of what we're doing, basically. It's a spectacle. And when you see two guys walk into the ring, you don't want to know who's going to win. And um, <laughs> a lot of times, unfortunately for me, when I walk into the ring with somebody, people assume, like, 
oh, John's going to crush this guy. But you got to keep in mind, I mean, I've done wrestling for eight years, then pro wrestling for the past 22, 23 years. I've done boxing for less than one year, and boxing is a very specialized skill set. I don't have a lot of training. Um, I have a lot of athletics and a lot of weird movements that don't really apply to boxing, and I've trained hard in a lot of different disciplines. But um, boxing, when I box professionals, I, I can just tell the difference. If I box somebody who's been a pro boxer for 10 or 15 years versus me, who's been a pro wrestler for 22 years and like had like a boxing fight and trained sometimes there's, there's levels. So finding someone on my level or even above my level, cause like, like athleticness and power and strength and the quickness can overcome a lot of skill sometimes um, is what I'm looking for. Amazing. Now, Obviously, you're around a lot of your former peers, Nick Nemeth, who you had some incredible matches with in the WWE. What's it been like catching up with a lot of old friends here at For the Love of Wrestling? It's been one of my favorite things about For the Love of Wrestling. Um, Dolph's, I don't know, are we allowed to say that? Are we allowed to say that or not? We'll call him Dolph. We'll we'll we can call him uh, Nick Nemeth. He was, uh, he was Nick Nemeth at my bachelor uh, party and, okay. and uh, at my wedding. He was, actually... <laughs> Uh, Ty was laughing because um, he was wearing a suit the other day, and she said, the only time I've seen Nick wear a suit was at our wedding. What the heck is going on? Um, this is when he won the title at New Japan, actually. Yeah. But um, catching up with him has been great. Uh, if you don't know this, we collaborated on a film, or he, he did a, a guest-starring spot in a film I did on YouTube called The Speed of Time. It's on YouTube for free. It's out now. Check it out. Watch uh, me, and, <laughs> me and Nick star in this uh, bizarre sci-fi action comedy, I guess I would classify it as. But um, it's it's fun talking chap with him, with Swag, with Riddle, with, yeah. with you know, with all the guys. Like it's a uh, it's really cool. And to even guys like Mark Merrow, who I would consider an acquaintance, you know. Um, but at events like this, I get to know him a lot better. Like Slaughter too, like. Our paths cross, but these are the times where I get to like really know the the generation that preceded me and realize just how much we have in common. And when you look at your storied history in WWE, some of the most athletically insane maneuvers that you pulled off in some of the best matches that I've seen in the company. You look at that Money in the Bank ladder match, WrestleMania 24, where you did the corkscrew moonsault with the ladder in hand. The IC title ladder match with Jeff Hardy where you were stood on top of the ladder and just decided to throw a drop kick whilst on the ladder, which was nuts. Out of all the crazy stunts that you've done in WWE, which was the one where you were the most apprehensive and like, is this a good idea heading into it? You know, you get apprehensive about all of them. Um, but usually when the bell rings, the apprehension leaves like you don't think about like I'm gonna get hurt or whatever. Like um, everything goes from like pain and injury to like oh I hope I don't get too damaged to finish the match. So your mindset shifts. Um, it's an interesting thing you bring up that because to me movement and creativity and creating new scenarios and moves is part of why I fell in love with wrestling, which is why I do it. And um, wrestling is an art form that's subjective. And so obviously, that specific aspect of wrestling is something that I love. I mean, I, I train a couple times a week, gymnastics, parkour, still trying to come up with new movements because it's just probably what I would do even if I wasn't wrestling. I just, I just love movement, integrating different kinds of martial arts with break dancing and different kinds of fighting. Um, but they're all things that when you get to a high level and you're combining like a, two or three different types of <laughs> movement disciplines into one crazy thing, things that make you nervous. And um, that basically is what adrenaline junkies look for. Like if you know you can do an arm drag, eventually you're going to get bored of arm drags, which is why I rack my brain to think of some weird combo of different moves that's difficult for me to pull up 
to pull off that maximizes my skill set. When you look at some of the best matches of your career, we look at the Intercontinental Talent or match that you had with Rey Mysterio on SmackDown where you won the belt. There was also a match that kind of goes under the radar, which I always used to go back and watch. It was probably around 2009 when you just got drafted to SmackDown and you faced Edge. That felt like you were about to get a main event push in the next year or so. That felt like that was a sort of litmus test for you to hang with, with the big dogs on SmackDown. You'd already proved it on Raw years before, even back as Johnny Nitro. But that felt right. This guy is 100% going to be a world champion after that match. Is that how you were feeling, particularly after that match? You felt that you'd proven yourself to the higher-ups in WWE? I felt like... I had always felt like I was going to be world champion. And um, I think that if you don't feel like you should be world champion or you never will be able to get to that level, maybe wrestling's not for you. Mm -hmm. Because with that in the back of my head, I mean, that's why I was at the gym last night until 1030. That's why I train every day. That's what I'm thinking about wrestling. And if, if you're not doing that, if you're just like phoning it in and showing up, it shows. It's not fun to watch. And um, that match that you're talking about with Edge meant a lot to me because he was one of the guys that um, that I watched before I started. Um, actually, the first wrestler that I met in real life was Christian. Wow. And when I told Christian that, he was like, oh, was, was I a dick to you? And I was like, no, actually, you were really nice. That's good. That's <laughs> and, then, good. and then he goes, oh, you know you were probably pretty big. <laughs> and I was like, no, was, that had nothing to do with it. You were just in a good mood that day, I think. You gave me some good advice. Um, but Ed, Edge, both those guys, they're, they're legends. And um, getting to have that match in particular, I'll never forget because it was like the first time that I felt like I got to have the match that I wanted to have with Edge. I'd been in the ring, shared the ring with him before. But... Um, Getting speared by Edge as Eric Bischoff's apprentice is a lot different than that match you just mentioned. That was a particular highlight for me, and I did see you as one of the rising stars on SmackDown during that time, the moment when you shifted from ECW to SmackDown. And I know that you mentioned you weren't particularly fond of the idea of switching from Johnny Nitro to John Morrison, but for me, that had WWE title all over it. It felt like that was a perfect storm in terms of gimmick, character, might work, in-ring work was always there for you. Was there ever a time where someone might have said, look, this is the direction they might be heading in. You're going to get a world title match at this event. And it didn't didn't happen for any reason. Oh, yeah, dozens of times. Yeah. Like that, I would, I would bet like half the guys out there right now had that happen. That some of them wanted the it, some thing. of it didn't. But like um, dozens of times... Um, Someone would come up and say, like, hey, John, you're going you're gonna to get a really big opportunity sometime coming up soon. Don't have all the details, but just keep that in mind. Keep doing what you're doing. Or, like, hey, John, you're just missing one thing. Uh, we had a meeting. You lose that fur coat, world champion. You just got to lose the fur coat. <laughs> there was something. You know what I mean? Yeah, the fur coat one was particularly funny because I was like, they must have, like, mentioned it in the meeting because, like, like four guys, like Michael Hayes, Bruce Prichard, like, like all of the same one day were like, you got to lose that fur coat, kid, and then you're going to be a star. I'm like, no, if you want, sure, but I don't think the fur coat is holding me back. <laughs> was there a particular program that you mentioned there that stands out for you that you think that would be awesome? I know it's not... It's not about talking about what ifs because you've had an incredible career, but was there no, something? About what ifs? That's more fun. What ifs right now for me are all at AEW. Uh, love to wrestle Moxley, Eddie Kingston, um, have a longer match with Orange Cassidy, <sighs> Trent Beretta, um, Daniel Bryan. I've never had a singles the Cesaro, the, uh, a lot of the New Japan guys, some of the CMLL guys, like. Um, I think would be surprised. I think I could out Lucha the CMLL guys, which is pretty crazy. Uh, Pentagon, Phoenix, I've wrestled a ton. I think they're like, I mean, you got Rey Mysterio and the Lucha Brothers are the top luchadors in the world, in my opinion. Um, but all those hypotheticals in AEW, to me, are what's exciting about it. Finding a tag partner 
was in the Young Bucks. I've done that before on the Indies, like way back in the day, and they've always been outstanding entertainers and like just generally like good people, fun to be around. So it'd be awesome to tag with them or against them. Um, Jungle Boy would be super fun to to do something with. I mean, back in the day, like he used to come over to my house when I had a ring in the backyard and train. And um, he still lives just a mile away. Every once in a while, I go train with him. I I feel like um, he should be on TV, and that kid could be a huge star. Um, it's it's all just depending on how people are used. And um, I take that back. If you have it, the it factor, and he, I believe he does, then it depends on how you're used. Mm. If you don't have it, you get forced on people's throats until they get sick of you. We kind of alluded to Ray Phoenix and Penta, those matches from Lucha Underground. That time of your life, Johnny Mundo, that was incredible. And we have the final Lucha Underground world champion, Jake Hager here as well. The roster was so stacked. And I was talking to Ty yesterday and we said how Lucha Underground pretty much birthed what AEW is today. Without Lucha Underground, that the essence of AEW wouldn't be there. How special of a time was that for you? A couple of things. First of all, um, I was the second phone call uh, for Lucha Underground. Who do you think the first call was? Go on, tell me. No, Blue Demon Junior. For some reason. Wow. Well, and then, I, I don't know how. I was and then get they, that one. no, you never <laughs> got it. And they, then they saw him wrestling. And we're like, oh. <laughs> um, but the talent that was on Lucha Underground. If you're thinking about like your Swerve, Ar Fox, Penna. Um, Phoenix, Taya, me, and Helico, PJ Black, um, Willie Mack, Brian Cage, like that, that roster, if you think about it, it, is a crazy roster. And like, we had a lot of creative autonomy and not a lot of handcuffs. So people were going hard and in, in a good way. Like we were competing with each other to have the best match of the night. And, um, if someone had an awesome match when they came back, it was like awesome and not like a oh you, you, you like dove too many times or like that was my move. None of that. It was a really positive, motivating environment that inspired people to work harder and push the limit. And I think that's what made it so cool to watch and be a part of. One final thing as well, we kind of touched upon it yesterday when we were just chatting off the cuff. The dirt sheet stuff with the Miz, the rap that you did on Crime Time was so funny, and it that was like before YouTube was a huge thing. I remember they put it on WWE.com back in like 2007 or something, and people still no. talk about that today. No. I tried to put it on my YouTube page, and uh, I got flagged and taken down, even though I um, paid like twenty dollars for that beat off some guy. <laughs> That was on Hollywood Boulevard. It just gave me this beat, whatever. Then I recorded me and Miz in my shower because I thought it would be like a recording studio on my video camera. And then just like spent forever syncing it up and tweaking it. Put that together and then had somebody film us on Melrose. But behind Melrose, there's all that graffiti. And then we went to the train tracks and did like a bunch of weird dancing and lip singing. And then I just cut it all together and put it out there. So you edited it as well, yeah. That, that that one, yeah. Most of the dirt sheet was edited by Stank, aka Steven Stankovich. But that uh, Misfits and Mofos, I, I edited, yeah. That that was a good time in WWE, man. Like you both, you, you transitioned from ECW to SmackDown. That was when you became SmackDown World Tag Champs. Good yeah. time, and the Miz was one of your boys, right? CM Punk and uh, Kofi for them tag championships on a live event, which rarely ever happens. So I was riding with the Miz. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like Miz, Ziggler, Zack Ryder, my boys, but like Bobby Lashley, Shelton, Carlito, Chris Masters, Hornswoggle, so many of the guys here. Like, it, it's kind of hard to make it in pro wrestling if you suck, you know? No one wants to hang out with some guy that sucks. And um, you're traveling together and you're working together all the time. And eventually, if uh, you're a jerk or too too loud or abrasive, people are going to start saying, you know who needs to get out of here <laughs> is that guy. <laughs> so they kind of like end up weeding themselves out or just, you know, it doesn't work for, for people. The way pro wrestling works is there's a balance between 
being greedy for yourself and working for the match. If you give too much, you're doing your opponent a disservice because you have to be emphatically yourself, which is like, I want to win. I want this for me. And that person has to do the same. But if then behind closed doors, you're politicking or you're, you're purposefully messing the, with their move set or switching things, then you're subtly sabotaging things and it's not fun. So th that's why usually people, uh, people that suck get weirded out to sum that up. You, know, you, you mentioned Punk there, and I know he's been a divisive guy in pro wrestling. You worked with him early on in ECW, and I'm guessing you were around him a bit in AEW before all the, the stuff kicked off as well. What have your interactions been like with him, and, and did you get on with him? Did you see eye to eye with him? Do you think Punk would consider a boxing fight? Does does that answer? I think that answers the question a little bit. No, I I have no, no problem with Punk. The uh, I didn't know like he was getting let go. Um, but the day before I was in Chicago, I had the day off. I texted him and asked him what he was doing, just because I knew he was going through some stuff. And if uh, he wanted to meet up and grab a workout or just hang out and talk, and he got back to me a little bit too late. Um, I can't say we got along from the start. But um, after a few months, we kind of became friends. And then we ended up riding together for two years, me, me him, and Gallows. Um, he was always cordial at AEW. I don't know what happened to him. Like, I think just feel like he kind of lost it. Like, I feel like he went too far in the direction of, I want this for me. I, I'm the best, believing his own hype. And clearly, like, when he decided to be a UFC fighter, believing his own hype kind of took over. Like, not thinking through, like, oh, wait a minute. I'm a pro wrestler, and I'm about to fight a pro fighter who spent their life learning how to do one thing, and that's fight for real. If that person tried to be a pro wrestler, they'd probably suck at it because they've never done it. Why do I think that I could go fight for real against someone who spent their life on that skill set? Um, but aside from that, like, I, I can't say like too much like uh, about him other than like we rode together, we got along. Um, he's a divisive, polarizing figure. The people that don't like him, I'm friends with, and um, they have very solid points. All right. I'll leave it at that. Well, it's been amazing chatting to you. I could talk with you all day, but I know you've got a lot of fans that want to hang out with you and nerd out with you today. One of the most athletically gifted wrestlers ever. We've got the other one who I mentioned today, Shelton Benjamin. You you guys. Oh, man, you talked to Shelton? Yeah. You talked talk to Shelton about the triple threat, like did. about one of the best matches that like... Uh, so me, Shelton Carlito, and at the time Molina was my manager, had this triple threat, and um, it was on live events for a couple months. And the first time we had it, it was all right. Then a little better. And we dialed this thing in to, like, I think one of the greatest triple threads of all time. But on live events, we'd have, like, a half hour. And it was, like, perfectly timed. And we got the crowd with every moment. And then we did it once on a pay-per-view. And instead of the half hour, I think we got, like, 14 minutes or something. And we're like, oh, man. But, like... Like, this whole match just works so well, and we're going to just bastardize it by, like, chopping the good parts out. And not all the good parts, but half of it, you know? And that's unfortunately what happened. And on TV, everyone saw it and was like, that was amazing. And we're like, ah, yeah, but it wasn't half as amazing as the live event version was. Well, it's, it's mad because I asked Shelton about his favorite match of his career, and he said the live event version of that. Nick Nemeth as well, he went, I listed some of my favorite matches of his career. He was like, bro, you don't even know about the live event stuff yeah. I was doing. Like, that's that's crazy, isn't it? That we're not even like, seeing this. The the last match I had against the Hardys was like me and Flip Gordon versus them. And I came out as Drip Gordon, because I was a Johnny Drip Drip, and demanded to come out to flash Gordon's theme song. And um, I had drip sticks and a whole bunch of rubber duckies. And I wanted to get what the duck over and duck you. And they both worked. And I dumped out these duckies and like sprayed everyone with water. <laughs> and, like, 
if you, it just, it was like super silly. But then when it came down to it, we still did me and flip double, like a double front flip off opposite corners. Both Hardys moved intricate spots into a double twist kick. Like we, we had a good match, but it was still silly. And you're right. Like some of those live events, the stuff that you get to do because you have full creative autonomy, um, you discover just the most bizarre and fun stuff that you can't quite do on TV. And it's a, it's a shame sometimes that you can't see it. I almost would love it if there was a way to like watch back a bunch of that old stuff. I know it exists somewhere on some crappy like Super YouTube. 8 camera yeah. <laughs> in the WWE vault. They should have just put them for free on YouTube. As soon as a live event finishes, they should let the, wo the world watch it. The reason they shouldn't and the reason they never will is because that's where the new guys learn. Right. And like, I don't know how, it would be really hard to learn how to be a wrestler today. Like when I started, I mean, Chilton mentioned this too probably, we were doing at least four shows a week, three live, one televised, sometimes five if there's a pay-per-view. And that was every week. And now people are doing one show a week, a TV taping. And sometimes their TV taping match is four minutes or they're not even having a match. So if you're new, new to the business now, like it's just way more difficult to, to learn how to work in front of a crowd. You can go to the gym and practice and learn the moves and sure all day, but it's different when you're in front of a crowd. Yeah, no, I completely get that. Um, all the AEW matches that you mentioned before that are in your sights, I want to see them. You deserve a world title run in that company. I hope we see it happening. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. I could talk all day with you about wrestling, man. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you, man.